Unicorns are real, folks. I can prove it. Uh, one of the most common questions I get is, do I ever work on anything that's not a giant pile of crap? And of course the answer is yes, but you guys rarely see that because, you know, generally speaking, it doesn't make for a very interesting video. But today we have an exception to that rule. This is a 1995 Dodge Ram 2500 four wheel drive with the P-Pump 12 valve Cummins. This thing is as close to a unicorn as you're ever gonna see. This thing is in incredible condition. For a 27 year old Illinois truck, I've never seen anything like it. I mean, there's a couple little, little blemishes in the paint. I mean, that's not even dented, but there is no rust at all. And they used it, apparently it pulled some kind of big horse trailer, but it must have been only in the summer. Interior, classic 90s red. Classic door, Dodge door panel. But yeah, power windows. Pretty clean. 150,000 miles. Manual transfer case. It's got the fancy radio. Look at that thing. I tell you what, I pick on Chrysler a lot because, because it's easy, but I like these trucks. I always have. I remember when they came out in the early nineties, it was like they were from another planet, you know, compared to the old body style Fords and, and Chevys, and especially to the previous generation Ram trucks. I mean, they were just a night and day difference. No more flipper windows. Got these nice round curves in the front. Plus you had Walker, Texas Ranger, Chuck Norris. He had one of these. He was always jumping ditches and chasing bad guys with it. Had the big brush guard on the front. And then of course, under the hood, we have the Holy Grail, the P-Pump 12 valve Cummins. So if you're not a big Cummins guy, uh, this is kind of this is kind of the mecca. So when they first came out with the uh, 12 valve Cummins in the Dodge trucks, they had the VE rotary injection pump, and they were not intercooled. They made maybe 160 horsepower. And then with this generation, they went to the Bosch inline P pump, and they added an intercooler. This one's got some kind of Banks power pack. Not sure what that's all about. Anyway, this truck belongs to a local YouTube viewer. He actually just bought it and he has a couple of concerns. The big ones are the transmission and it's using coolant. I'm not sure about the transmission. It does seem a little funny. When you first start it up, it seems to slip pretty badly. Uh, but once you get going, it works, it works normally. And then the, the coolant loss, I don't know. I mean, I ran it just long enough to get it inside the shop and it already pressurized the system. So we're gonna do some testing, but I have a sneaking suspicion that it may have a bad head gasket. So I think that's where we're gonna start. All right, we're gonna test the head gasket with this combustion leak detector kit from Lyle Tools, 75500. Uh, but Harbor Freight's been ripping off all the Lyle Tools lately, so I think they have a version of this one now. Anyway, it has a kind of a vial here, and we're gonna fill that up with a combustion leak indicating fluid. And this is for gas engines. There's a separate one for diesel engines. I think the part number is not on here. Anyway, I don't know why, what the difference is, but there is a different fluid for gas versus diesel. So we're gonna fill this guy up to the line. And then we're gonna put this over top of the radiator. And on a gas engine, you would hook up this line on the top to a vacuum port but this being a diesel engine has no vacuum. So we're gonna use a separate vacuum pump. 
and we'll just do our Austin Powers routine. And we're gonna try to draw gases through the coolant, you know, draw them out of the cooling system. And if there are combustion gases, this liquid is gonna change colors. Well, that's good news. The fluid did not change colors, so I believe we do not have a bad head gasket. Perhaps we just have an external coolant leak. So let's, uh, let's pressure test it, and we'll find out. Okay, now we wait for a leak. Is it windy out there, pup? I know. Shouldn't ask questions you know the answer to. All right, folks, I inadvertently left the, uh, the pressure tester on overnight, and now we've got a big mess. Uh, but I found two leaks, and they are both on the coolant elbows for that big round cylinder back there behind the turbo. I believe that is the transmission cooler. So it's leaking from the one there at the back and it's also leaking from that one right there behind the alternator. So we need two 5 8 coolant elbows and probably some new clamps. It's gonna be a real, real bugger to replace those. Probably gotta pull the alternator to get the front one, and then the back one, I don't even know. Stand on my head, I guess. Uh, yeah, we'll order some 5 8 elbows. I've gotta get new valve cover gaskets. He wants to run the overhead. And then, uh, I guess the fuel gauge doesn't work. All right, the sending unit is unplugged. So the gauge should be all the way at empty. And it is, and the little warning light's on. Okay, the wires are shorted together. So it should go to full. Uh, it should go to full. All right, something must be wrong. It really should go all the way. Okay, I think it should go further than that because the normal sending unit, I believe, goes from 10 to 90 ohms and we've got zero ohms. I guess that's pretty well pegged out. It just moves slow. So, I guess we need a sending unit. The problem is this is a 95 and they don't make this sending unit anymore. The solution, I guess, is you had to retrofit the sending unit from the 96 and 97. Uh, the problem there is the pigtail is different, so you got to splice in a pigtail. And also the 96 and 97 sending unit is pretty hard to find. I did find some, some places online that have it pretty pricey and you got to drop the tank to, to install it. You know, it's kind of nice to have a working gas gauge, as we found out recently. All right, we're almost done with our diagnostics. He is concerned about the charging system. 
He says, when you first start it, the voltage is low, like well below 12 volts, and it stays there for a few minutes before it jumps up to, you know, 13, 5, 14 volts where you would expect to see it. And that sounds normal to me, at least for a diesel engine. So these, these trucks don't have glow plugs, but they do have grid heaters. It has two of them. There's one there and one there. And they take a huge amount of amps. And a lot of people don't realize that those grid heaters and glow plugs, they stay on after the engine started, long after the, the wait to start light goes out. And that's just for emissions reasons. They want to keep the, keep the nasty blue black smoke from coming out of the tailpipe when you first start it up. Okay. Yeah, that seems normal to me. You can almost hear it, you know, hear the engine change pitch when those grid heaters shut off. So, I'm saying that's okay. Uh, one of the things that sucks about these, this era of Dodge truck is that the voltage regulator for the alternator is actually built into the computer. So, yeah, the computer directly con controls the field, and but that can be a problem. Uh, you can find instructions on forums on how to, how to retrofit a separate regulator if that part of your computer ever dies. Anyway, this one's fine. Let's move on to the next, the next item. I think our fuel pressure is fine. It bounces around, but that's not unusual for a piston style pump. Should be 25 PSI minimum at, I forget, 1800 RPM or something like that. We're about 35 PSI at idle, so that should be more than enough. We'll check it again once we get the fuel filter and uh, sending unit replaced just to see, see if anything changed. Well, let's find out if the bottom side's as clean as the top side. It appears to be. So just like the Fords and Chevys from this, this vintage, the uh, spring hangers have a tendency to rot out. Not sure what that's all about, but it looks pretty decent. Yeah, drum brakes. That's some kind of a magnesium diff cover. It's supposed to give you better cooling. Probably holds a little more fluid too. New shocks, I think they're KYBs. It's got a upgraded exhaust. Looks pretty darn good. And yeah, we got some interesting wiring here. I think that's for the trailer. Probably for the brake controller. Transfer case looks good. It's got a new tail shaft seal. Leaking a little bit there. No big deal. All the U-joints are good. I checked them. Uh, it's also got a some kind of magnesium pan on the transmission. And there's a temp sensor. He says that temp sensor doesn't work. So I don't know what that's going to involve. That's all added on stuff. Yeah. Not too greasy on the bottom side. I mean, this is a Cummins. It's like maybe a new starter. Uh, the brakes are getting pretty low. It's got about four millimeters of pad on both sides. Front U joints are good. He says the steering is loose. 
I'm not exactly sure what he means by that. All this stuff is new. The stabilizer is new. The steering links look like they're new, new tie rod end. That's a new steering box, pitman arm. I mean, the whole works, sway bar links. So maybe he just has never driven a Dodge. I did find uh, this one ball joint over here is a little bit loose. I don't know if you guys will be able to see it or not. Oh, that's blown out, isn't it? Come on, light. So if we pry up here, it's got just a shade of up and down movement. The other side's already been replaced, but overall it looks pretty good. Of course, with the Cummins, we're always concerned about the killer dowel pin. I don't see any signs that it's actually had the timing cover off. So that would be something to, uh, to investigate. Sounds like we have a visitor. You look wet. Mm -hmm. Hi. Good job, pup. So glad you made this pile of stuff for Max to take apart. Yeah. All right, folks. We've got parts. Coolant, transmission fluid, fuel filter, oil filter, transmission filter, brake pads, thermostat, thermostat gasket, ball joint, ball joint, coolant elbows, valve cover gasket set, and a new fuel sending unit with a pigtail. I ended up buying this one online from a place called Gino's Garage. On the coolant, we're gonna change to an extended life coolant instead of the old green stuff. This is Prestone Command. It's basically the same as Peak Final Charge. It's an NOAT coolant. I don't know, it's a minefield out there as far as coolants go, but basically anything that says CAT EC1 should be good for a diesel engine. We had to reuse this rollover vent valve. It's got a little flapper inside so it won't leak out fuel. If you get the thing Tango Uniform, which I don't recommend doing, if you can help it, well, that's not gonna go. Hey, there it is. 
Boy, they do not want that thing coming out of there. Cool. Nice thing about Gino's Garage, they have a full instruction sheet here, including some trivia. As you already know, your 94 to 95 Dodge turbo diesel fuel tank sending unit is no longer available. You can make the 96 to 97 sending unit work if you use this wiring adapter. The harness adapter has to be modified. It recommends that we trim off these two tabs. So that's what we're going to try to do. Cut towards your buddy, not towards your body, right? some more light. There it is. Okay. Look at that. Cross the sending unit off the list. That's not a bad job, especially on this truck, because it's not rusty at all. I didn't record much of it. Like I said, I know I have another video about dropping one of these tanks on a similar vintage Dodge. It was quite a bit crustier, and even that one wasn't too bad. The hardest part is just getting the lines unhooked. But fuel systems is one of the things I think Chrysler really does well. They were one of the first companies to start using plastic tanks, especially on pickups. They've been doing this going back into the 80s. And the sending units and pumps are also plastic, at least on the pickups, so you don't get all that swelling where the quick connect lines hook up. Yeah, even their EVAP systems are pretty good. All right, let's move on. There it is, folks. If you wanted proof that this thing is rust free, there it is right there. Man. You couldn't do that when those were one year old. Yeah, somebody's already had this apart. For the U-joints or the ball joints or God knows what. Uh, so the problem here with this vintage of Dodge is that this is an inboard rotor. So we've got to pound the studs out to get the rotor off. Which I can't really do from this angle. We'll give it a shot. 
These are big beefy rotors, but they don't put much meat on them. They're only about 10 thousandths over the discard thickness. It's about 0.25 millimeters. And we need probably at least twice that to machine them. It's a pain to machine these two. I've, I've done it before in an engine lathe with a four jaw chuck. The best way to do it is with an on-car brake lathe, but most shops don't have one of those, including mine. Anyway. We're going to have to toss these, get some new ones, no big deal. Well, I think I missed the money shot. It's loose. I should have just thrown them on the floor. It's moving, but it quickly bottoms out. So we're gonna have to do something a little different here. Beautiful. joint comes with this installation adapter. That is not how it's supposed to be used, but it does the trick. You're supposed to put it up here. There we go. Oh well, no harm, no foul. All right, we wanna make sure this sleeve can move freely.
All right, we're supposed to tighten the bottom one to 44 foot-pounds. Then the top to 69. Now the bottom to 150. All right, we gotta tweak this top one just a bit more to get the cutter pin in. Looks good. I think that's it. This top sleeve here, it has to move freely up and down. That's how it accounts for the difference between the two ball joints. So they're not pulling against each other. It also needs to be kept in the same orientation. So when we took it apart, the split was facing out. It's still facing out. That's how you adjust the camber. Uh, there's all kinds of different offset ball joints and doodads you can buy for these dodges to change the, the camber and caster. These are stock, stock ball joints. And there's no boots on these ball joints. They have these nifty inner boots. It's the new, the new Moog style. There it is. Now we mushroomed the end of the studs pretty good, hitting them with a the hammer. So I just touched them up on a bench grinder and then I ran a thread chaser over them should be just fine. This is a super handy kit, by the way, of thread chasers just for wheel studs. There's the part number from Lang. I'll see if I can find a, uh, a link to that. got another problem. The left side axle seal has been leaking. I saw it was wet. I thought maybe it was just grease from the U-joint, but that was wishful thinking. It's definitely leaking from the seal. So there's no better time to deal with that than now. And unfortunately on these, these Dana axles, the seal is on the inside. So I've removed the, uh, Differential carrier and the seal we want is right there. Now, while we're replacing that one, we might as well replace the other one. Which normally is pretty easy, but on these dodges, you get a bit of a curveball because they have this axle disconnect mechanism. See that shift fork there? So the other seal is actually right there. So we're going to knock those out and we'll knock a couple new seals in, put this back together. Like I said, there's no better time to deal with it than, than right now.
All right, here's our new seal. Set that up there like so. There's lots of fancy tools you can buy to do this job. They go between, they go between the welded axle tubes here. And you just thread them apart. This is what I use. Bunch of sockets cobbled together. Does the same thing. Looks pretty good. I go just a hair further but I think it's pretty good now the secret is you got to have a socket that fits inside the seal presses on the metal part of it without damaging the the rubber this is an inch and a half three-quarter drive socket works pretty good I don't know, Wes. This might have been one of the times you should have bought the special tool. Well, the right side is quite a bit more complicated. So we have to install this collar and then the inner axle has to be slid in from the end. That's why I cleaned all the gunk out of the axle tube. This is a brush that I just jammed in a piece of pipe that I used to clean out that axle tube. I'm going to use the other end to push the intermediate axle through. That's pretty good. A lot of times when you pull the right side axle you have to take this shift cover off because this collar will will fall down where you can't get it realigned okay. 
think that's it. So when you're in four wheel drive, it shifts this collar over and engages the two shafts together. Two wheel drive, it pulls it back. Well, these calipers are kind of a trip compared to what we're used to today. These trucks had a fancy new body, but there's a lot of the old Chrysler still in them. Now the fun part. Oh, this side's gonna go easy. The other side was not so much fun. Come on. That's pretty brave. That is a steep embankment. <laughs> I think he's gonna back out of it. Seems awful early for mowing ditches. I used to have that job, mowing ditches for the township, back when I was about 18. I remember one time I hit a mattress or the uh, the steel springs left over from a mattress and we had about an 85 horsepower Massey Ferguson tractor and it just shut it down instantly. I ended up taking it to my dad's shop. We had a bat wing mower just like that but it only had one wing and we had to cut the, the mattress springs out with a torch. Somebody installed this extra deep aftermarket aluminum transmission pan. Man, that thing is nice. That is a beefy casting and it holds a ton of transmission fluid. 
Uh, it's got a temp sensor in the side. He told me that the gauge doesn't work, but I tested the sensor. The sensor does work. I just measured the, the resistance and applied some heat and it, it does change resistance. So I think that the sending unit is good. Must have a wiring problem up, up to the gauge. On the transmission itself, I installed a new filter. It's got that riser block there to lower the filter down into that deep pan. And then I adjusted the bands. There's an adjustment right here for the low reverse band. Tighten the little screw there to 72 inch pounds and back it off three turns. And there's one up there, up there for the, uh, the forward band. Same deal, tighten it to 72 inch pounds and then you back it off one and seven eighths turns. That one's a little tricky. You have to have a square adapter. I've got this eight point socket, works pretty good. Anyway, I'm gonna put the pan back on. We'll fill it back up with transmission fluid and we should be done here on the bottom side. We made a hell of a mess, but I think we're done on the bottom side of this truck. Got our new sending unit, new pigtail. I changed the fluid in the transfer case. Changed the transmission fluid and filter, rotated the tires. We did the axle seals, new brakes, a couple new ball joints. Boy, it's had a lot of work done up here in the front, but that's typical for these Dodges. I mean, I don't know what it is. That, that's a Dana axle. Other companies have used this same axle without much issue, but on these Dodges, it just doesn't work. I don't know why they're hard on ball joints. They're hard on tie rod ends. And even when you get that stuff replaced and it's like new, they, they still wander all over the road. I did tighten the sector gear in that steering gear. It's not too difficult. There's a little set screw there at the top, loosen the jam nut, tighten it up. It's better. It's still not very good. I don't know who rebuilt that thing, but I don't have a whole lot of hope for it. Anyway, yeah, let's move on. I also had to replace the oil drain plug. I'll show you the old one. Yeah, somebody has way over tightened that. Mushroomed it all out. Do, 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 do. All right, let's go after the thermostat. I think. Got the serpentine belt off already. 13, yeah. Uh, you Cummins guys tell me, shouldn't this have constant tension clamps on the upper radi radiator hose instead of these worm clamps? I thought they did. It's been a while. Now, the hoses are both new, so I'm assuming somebody did a little swap at some point. And those constant tension clamps are a pain in the butt, but they are kind of nice because they don't They don't weep. It's a big problem here because we have huge temperature fluctuations certain times of the year. And uh, yeah, these clamps just don't, they don't stay tight or whatever, they leak. Inevitably.
And there's our elbow. Come on. We're getting pretty close. Thermostat's done. Transmission's full. We don't need this anymore. Engine's full. Let's do the valve adjustment real quick. I'm not gonna get too, too in depth with it. There's 9,000 videos about how to adjust valves on a 12 valve Cummins. It's really not a big deal. All right, step one. We're gonna remove this beauty cover. There we go. It doesn't look too bad. All right, we have to get number one cylinder at top dead center. The best way to do that is to rotate the engine with a barring tool that goes in the bell housing and turns the flywheel. If you don't have that, you can use a 7 8 socket on the alternator pulley. The catch is you have to turn it counterclockwise, which is backwards. Won't matter. It's going to get us to the same place, but. It is a little weird. All right, so our exhaust valve on number one is closing. And we should see the intake valve start to open. No. All right, so we're not in valve overlap. So we gotta go one whole turn. All right, so our intake valve is opening. And when it closes, we should be at top dead center. Okay. All right, so right now we're in valve overlap on cylinder number one, which means that cylinder number six, the companion cylinder, should be at top dead center compression. So I made myself a little note here. We should be able to set intake and exhaust on number six, intake on number five, exhaust on number four, intake on number three, exhaust on number two, and nothing on number one because it's an overlap. So there's tension on both those valves. There's a timing pin underneath of the injection pump. It's a little plastic plunger, you just push it in and it should engage a hole in the cam when number one cylinder is on top dead center compression. But 
in my opinion, the valve overlap is close enough. So that's how I do it. All right, we'll start with number two exhaust. Should be loose and it is 14 millimeter wrench. Well, let's just check the clearance first. The exhaust clearance should be 20 thousandths, 0.5 millimeters. Well, I don't know, it's pretty dang close. So we could tighten it just a hair. That looks good. Now, number three intake should be 10 thousandths 0.25 millimeters that one's pretty tight that's pretty good Number four exhaust. Uh, everybody makes way too big a deal about, you know, like how much drag should you have on the feeler gauge and all this crap. Uh, it really doesn't make that much difference. Typically the tolerance on the valve adjustment is plus or minus two thousandths, which is more than you would think. That's pretty good. All right, now we gotta do the last two. That's a little more tricky. Now we need to bar the engine over 360 degrees until number six is in cylinder overlap. Okay, once that intake valve closes, we should see the exhaust valve start to open. That's it right there. This time we set intake and exhaust on number one, intake on number two, exhaust on number three, intake on four, and exhaust on five. And then we're done. Well, cylinder number one should now be on top dead center compression. Should be on top dead center compression. Yep, yeah, it is. So that one feels pretty tight on the intake valve. Pretty good. All right, the valves are set. We're just gonna go through and double check the jam nuts. There is a torque spec for these. You can torque them if you like. I like to use my calibrated elbow. And it works just fine. That's it, guys. Nothing to it. Are you saying you got up there, but you can't get down? Yeah, I thought. Yeah. I could. I'm just not wearing the right shoes. Grab a greasy paw. Oh. Thank you. Safe. Max, what's your story? Gone. Check this out. I figured out why the valve covers were leaking so bad. See that pattern right there? It's also on that one. I believe that is from one of the Chrysler factory cable ties.
the zip ties they use. Looks like they got a piece of it under the valve cover gasket, actually on two of the valve covers. So that'll do it. Must have been just pouring oil out of there. I think that's it guys. I cleaned the fuel strainer, replaced the fuel filter. Uh, we might replace this shutdown solenoid here. He told me it, it died on him kind of mysteriously, so I'm a bit suspicious of that thing. I got the coolant elbows installed. That was not a whole lot of fun, but doable. Valve covers are back on. I've had good luck with these Felpro gaskets, but I don't know why they had to make them all blue. Somebody gonna pop the hood and say, ooh, blue gaskets. I see you went with the Felpro. Very fancy. I doubt it. Anyway, I drained about four gallons of coolant out. I put about four gallons of distilled water in. We're gonna run it for a bit, make sure the thermostat opens, and then we'll drain that and do a final fill of the coolant. Hold the gas to the floor and then crank it. If it starts, let off the gas. Gas to the floor and crank it. Okay. All right, don't put the gas to the floor and crank it. See if it'll start. So just crank it? <clears throat> yep. <laughs> gas to the floor. <laughs> One more time. <laughs> Hold it about quarter throttle. That's better. This is where it gets tricky. We can either do math or we can kind of take a big fat guess. I drained about four gallons of coolant out. I put four gallons of distilled water in. We ran it and then I drained four gallons of diluted coolant back out. The problem is you can't get all the coolant out no matter what you do. Some engines have a block drain. This one might, I don't know where it is. Doesn't matter. What's left in the engine should be pretty diluted. Maybe about 20, 25% of the old green coolant. The rest is distilled water. I think we're gonna put two gallons of concentrate in, and then we'll mix up two more gallons of 50-50. We'll try that, we'll run it for a bit, we'll check it with the hydrometer, and we'll just see where we're at, go from there.
Look at that thing. She's one backlit amplifier away from the Fast and the Furious. is an odd experience. The Oath Keepers. Well, we better shut that off. Lars will have us thrown in prison. Cool. We're audio installers. I think we're done, folks. Let's go for a drive. Right along. The steering seems better too. I mean, that's not bad for one of these Dodges. Trans temperature is still not working though. The needle has definitely moved. I wonder if there's some kind of a thermostat in the transmission. I'm not an automatic transmission guy. Certainly not with Chrysler's. Anyway. This thing runs and drives like a million bucks. It really does. 156,000 miles. I mean, honestly, it goes down the road like you just drove it off the dealer lot. Quite an operation there just to make wood chips. That's funny. Beautiful day today. What a sweetheart of a truck. Yeah. I like it. A lot. Wish it was mine. Yeah, it's too nice to be around here. Makes me nervous.